All right, uh, we'll, um, we'll start off with some aspect of uh, what you just heard. We've got uh, Abu Andrew, who is the Secretary General of uh, the Arawa Progressive Initiative, joining us on our studios in Abuja. Uh, good morning, Mr. Andrew. Now, listening to all the back and forth about how this is supposed to be coordinated, um, look, you've also had monitored some of these things for a while. How impactful do you think that all of these programs are actually getting to the people? Is it properly coordinated from your perspective? Um, good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, I must say that the social investment program, which is a program of the government of the president, Muhammad Buhari led administration, has been a program that has been successful, and I will, and I'll give it I'll give it ninety percent. The program has been able to the program has been able to you know reach out to the vulnerable people and the poor in the society in in almost all the states across the federation now there is no doubt that this program cannot solve all the challenges that people with people who have you know one challenge or the other in the society who this pro this program is uh, is taking care of you know, so we need to acknowledge that fact, but it still does not mean that this program has not gone a long way to, you know, alleviate the poverty of a lot of Nigerians, you know, that are dependent on this program. In 90%, how did you come about that? 90%, that's, in fact, that's very excellent. So how did you come about that figure? Now, now, now the success of this program and the people that are captured for these programs is what I am narrowing the percentage I have given. I am not saying that this program has captured 90% of poor people in our society or the vulnerable people in the society. You know. Now, we need to acknowledge the fact that this program, when it came on stream in 2016, was domiciled in the presidency, and it was overseen by a coordinator and was managed in the presidency. Now, when the president in 2019 got re-elected, he decided to move the program by institutionalizing it, moving it into the humanitarian ministry, which is being headed by the Honorable Minister Sadia Farouk. Now, this program before now has successfully at least reached out to the people that it seems to take care of, you know. Unfortunately, in the last few months that the program was moved to the ministry, it seemed to have some, some problems, you know, and it is, it is clear that something is wrong somewhere. Now, if the, if the, the minister who is now the coordinator of this program, can tell us that this program has, that she's struggling, she's still battling to understand some of the programs, of, of the four programs under the social investment program, then there's clearly a disconnect somewhere. Now, the social investment program it is, not, is not rocket science, and it is not us trying to find a solution for the cure for coronavirus. You know, so at this point in time, considering the fact that this program is a program that every Nigerian who is within that category that the program takes care of is, is looking forward to how their situation can be, can be improved, we cannot afford for the minister who is now the coordinator of these programs to tell us that she's still struggling after eight months of being the minister, that she's still struggling to, or battling to understand some of these programs. So clearly there is, there is a problem somewhere and we, we need for the minister to go back to the drawing boards and see where things need to be appropriately done.
when, uh, for, so on the one hand is the fact that uh, this, uh, mo now more than ever before, a significant number of people are wondering how their lives could be made better, you know, with this program. So on the one hand, you said that the program has been excellently successful. On the other hand, is that comment that you heard from the minister uh, that she's still battling to understand it, and you have also said there seems to be something wrong somewhere. What kind of response, or what kind of reaction do you think the people who you say have benefited from it uh, over the years, what kind of reaction do you think they will be having now with the minister saying what she said? Okay, clearly it is, you, you'll understand that the minister is struggling, you know, to even understand or comprehend what this program is about. Now, when the program was domiciled in the presidency, we had cluster heads that are in charge, were in charge of these programs. Right now, I cannot tell you categorically if the minister is working with these cluster heads, because if she's working with these cluster heads, I don't think she should be having the kind of problems or difficulties in understanding what these programs seek to address. You know? So I think right now what the minister needs to do is to sit back, go back to the drawing board, sit down and see where she has gotten it wrong and see the places she needs to address. Because clearly there is a disconnect and it is also very clear that she's not, she has not assumed the position of supervisory over these four programs in the social, in the social investment programs. And that is why she's finding it difficult to understand this. Now, as a minister, Let you just need to supervise all the clusters Head, head of the clusters of the programs running. If you, if you want to coordinate it yourself, there is definitely, it will burn you out. And that is Mr. What, from, from what the minister Mr. Andrew, has even told us by herself. Okay, just hang on a minute. We've got uh, Mr. Yoa Para uh, on the line with us. He is the national coordinator of the National Social Safety Net Coordinating Office. He joins us uh, on the line for my morning. Good morning and thank you for joining us today. Well, as you know, there's been several questions concerning how this register is being developed. Could you start with that? Talk to us about that. Um, good morning, Chris, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, apologize, the connection has not been so great where I am to get on Skype. Uh, but thanks for the opportunity. The, nation, the National Social Register is a collection of state social registers, the state uh, developed the social register through um, a, a community-based uh, targeting system where the community members will sit together um, and be divided in three focal group discussions. One group for the youth, one group for the male uh, adults, and one group for the women. All three groups will define what they understand by poverty in the context of the community. And you see definitions where uh, someone says, uh, because they are living 10 people in one round hut in a whole compound, and they can't afford basic housing, or they can't afford meals because we see only smoke coming out of their round hut only once a day. Those kind of definitions. So within the context of that community, what do they understand by poverty and then vulnerability? Once that is done, we ask them to identify the households. Of course, preceding this is a whole sensitization in the whole community, wherein the officers will go into the community and sensitize the entire community before they come to this grouping where they decide, uh, they, 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 they define the poverty. Then the, all the three groups will identify those within the community who are considered poor and vulnerable within the context of their definition of poverty in that community. Well, group, yeah, and then... Uh, Mr. Perra? With me, yeah. This is Chamberlain in the studios. Could you, how is that method standardized? Is that a global reference point? How does that work? Is it universally acceptable to use that standard to determine who's poor? Yes. Uh, it is called the community-based targeting system. A good number of countries use it as global best practice. So there are a number of targeting systems. 
There is a proxy mean test targeting system where you use certain parameters or assets to determine uh, who is poor or not within a community, uh, and then you enumerate them. There is a universal targeting where you enumerate all commas to the game uh, or give access to people who feel they are poor uh, to apply to, and then you enumerate them. And then there's a community-based targeting system. The Nigerian government adopted a combination of three targeting systems. I didn't want to go so technical. That's why I honed in only on the community base where the community uh, identified the poor and vulnerable. The integrity of the register rests within the community. The power is to the people and the community who identify the poor and vulnerable in a very, very transparent uh, manner. And like I was saying, when these three groups identify the poor and vulnerable, we harmonize the list. The entire community come together in plenary. And they now, they now agree that the people that they have selected or identified are actually the poor and vulnerable. The community will then select, identify two people, one male and one on this list. So for every community, uh, at the moment, we are in 46,000 communities. We have raised this register in 46,000 communities across 35 states of the Federation. Every community that this register has been raised and you go to, you will see a harmonized list that the community has signed. And it's in the custody of the community. They are in the community. Okay. Uh, briefly, uh, how many local governments? This is across how many local governments? This is, um, at the moment, across uh, 413 local governments in the country. I'd like to go back to the, to the beginning because, yes, a lot of people have asked, how is this register formed? And you said that, you know, individuals will select or they will, I mean, say what poverty means to them in the context of their community. Who selects these individuals? How are they selected? It's all individuals in the community. Like I said, the entire community is gathered in a central place. After the sensitization... We, de we divide the community in three groups. One group is the youth, one is the female, and one is the male adult. All three groups we sit separately. And then they will define, and then they will identify the families that are poor and vulnerable within the community. The three groups will then be brought together to harmonize the list. So the youth list will be put down, the ad male adult list will be put down, and the, the female list will be put down. And the names, so is Musa in the youth, uh, youth list? Yes. Is it in the female list? Yes. Is it in the male list? Yes. This automatically, that a poor family will put it there. Is Yusuf or is uh, Obi in the uh, youth list? Yes. Is he in the female list? No. Is he in the male adult list? No. Why are the youths putting Obi family as poor and vulnerable and not the female? The female might stand up and say, look, in actual sense, Obi is not poor. Obi has this, Obi has that. It doesn't meet our own definition. Mr. Hewa, just, just a moment. How do you even, you know, reach out to these people? Do you go through the traditional rulers? Do you go through the local government chairman? How do you reach out to the people in these communities? Who coordinates that for you? Okay, so the state government first appoints or recruits civil servants to man the office we call the State Operations Coordinating Unit. These state operations coordinating units are in every state ministry of planning. It is deliberate that they are in ministry of planning because that is the ministry responsible for planning, development, measuring impact, and uh, developmental progress for the state. So it's a database for the states to use for their planning, but also for all social intervention. Now, the state team will then go to the local government. And through a very competitive process that we advertise in the local government, within the planning unit of the local government and the community development unit, and then they will recruit local government staff into what we call a community-based targeting team. This community-based targeting team is made up of three teams. Each team will have uh, four targeting officers and six enumerators. The four targeting officers are the ones that will go to a community for pre-sensitization. So they will meet community leaders and tell them what 
exercise we want to do in terms of the social register. The community leaders will then mobilize all their community members on a certain date. The targeting officers will come back and sensitize the entire community that we are developing a register of poor and vulnerable. And this register of poor and vulnerable is an information gateway for potential eligible beneficiaries into any social intervention program. It could be cash transfer, it could be skills for job or public works, it could be any program or philanthropy organization or private sector or donor agencies that are targeting the poor and vulnerable for poverty alleviation or anything like that that will, they will come and mine this data and go back and register these people for that particular program to enjoy the benefit. Okay. So what Mr. Perra, one moment. Uh, you said just a little while ago that you interface with uh, state governments who then lead you to local governments and then further down to the communities. How well informed are state governors in this matter, in the, because in the light of the hoopla going on about this whole thing now, it would seem like um, there's a lot of secrecy about it. How well informed are uh, the state governors of the 35 states you mentioned about this program? The, the state governors signed a memorandum of understanding with the federal government with, through our office. So for every the 36 states of the federation and, um, uh, and the FCT, a memorandum of understanding was signed uh, with the state government as far back as 2017 when we started. Now, this memorandum of understanding establishes uh, certain uh, parameters and um, asks of the state government and of the federal government. The state government are responsible for establishing the state offices within the planning ministry. And they are also responsible for recruiting civil servants in a competitive manner to man this office. So for every state uh, government, we have an office. And when we have that office reporting to the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Planning, it is then expected that they are given their governors full briefing. I have also met a lot of state governors to also brief them. Only yesterday I was with the governor of Ebony State, the day before yesterday with the governor of Igbo State. And so the governors know this. We have made several attempts to also socialize the use of the social register across all government ministries, departments, and agencies. And Tapera, thank you for that. But um, what then do you make of the misunderstanding or lack of understanding of the legislature and the, the opinion of the Minister of uh, uh, Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management about not understanding um, the program and even wondering about the authenticity of the list. The Honorable Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management, Social Development, Hajia uh, Sadia Omar Farouk is my supervisor. I report to her and she has been very clear in our understanding of the social register. In fact, the directive I have from her is to rapidly in, uh, expand the register in light of the COVID-19 crisis. And we have discussed extensively the strategies uh, for doing this. While we continue the community-based targeting system, we are also thinking about the COVID-19 uh, response register. All right, well, we're trying to lump in a couple of things before we wrap up. How many people are on that register at the moment? 11 million people uh, People are on that list. But we take the information from the point of view of the household. So we have 2.6 million households on the social register made up of 11 million uh, people. So how does this then stand in the face of the World Bank's uh, World Poverty Clock Index that says over 97 or 91 million Nigerians are below the poverty line? Very, very clearly so. So, um, the poverty index, absolute poverty index of Nigeria stands between 58% to 61%, depending on the literature you are reading. This will put it at about 14 million families, or 15 million families, if you look at average uh, number of families of 3.5, between 3.5 to 5, 5 members per family. So, you have about 14 million families. We are at the moment at 2.6 million uh, families. How do you update this register? 
Because if someone last year was on that list, and then uh, maybe the, depending on the community, if they say, well, he's got a threshold, a certain threshold, maybe a certain amount of money you know, on a daily basis, if he's gone above that, how do you ensure that they don't remain on the register? The register is updated every uh, two uh, steps. Uh, through going back to the same community, holding the same exercise. There is also a grievous redress mechanism because the two individuals the community will choose will be the grief, sorry, the grievous redress mechanism for car persons. These people will be responsible for those who uh, are falling or slide into poverty, or feel they, uh, they, 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 they were not uh, well, that at What is this uh, conversation, just pardon me, because we need to wind down soon. What is this conversation about counterpart funding on the part of the federal government? The federal government, when uh, the agreement was signed with the World Bank, uh, the federal government had counterpart funding. And yes, the federal government has paid uh, uh, a part of the counterpart funding and is still uh, uh, paying because the uh, credit from the World Bank uh, does not uh, uh, permit operational costs. The, the federal government has been giving us operational, quarterly operational costs uh, uh, as part of that counterpart funding. So, yes, the federal government is also uh, doing its best on its own part to meet uh, the demands of that credit. And that's why we've been fully operational all through the year. And even in this COVID-19 period, the state team has fully been mobilized. Uh, I think it will be fair on a lot of our viewers if I don't ask you this. Now, so many people have said they've not received their empower stipend for the month of March. Some of them say for even eight months. So I'd like to ask, what exactly is happening? Um, I, 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 do, I'm not, uh, I do not sit on top of empower, interestingly. Uh, but uh, I know that they were paid the January stipend. They were paid in January, uh, I would think. Um, I know. And the Honorable Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development is also working hard to see that they are also uh, paid uh, the other, uh, the remaining months and the arrears. Uh, this, of course, you know, has to do with resources. Uh, and as soon as resources are released, payments are made. And the processes, uh, I assure you, are in top gear to meet all the uh, uh, payments. Uh, like I said, I'm not responsible for M Empower, but we are in a whole team together that uh, is uh, supervised and managed. Uh, by all right, Mr. Yo Apera, we do appreciate your talking to us this morning, even though there's still many areas where people will need a lot more clarification. But let, let's get back to Mr. Andrew about this. Uh, Mr. Andrew, could you talk to us? Uh, well, where do you stand on this? Where some think, look, there is no such thing as counterpart funding, but they think there is counterpart funding. What is your impression of that? Okay. Um, I, would, I would rather like to touch on the fact that Mr. Pera said that the Honorable Minister has told him that they want to expand the 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 numbers of the people on the social prog uh, social investment programs, especially for the pe for the vulnerable people and the poor. Now, I think that is the conversation we should be having at the moment. You know, we should we should we should have passed long ago passed. You know, the conversation where we are still uh, uh, you know there are still, people are still struggling or battling to understand this program. The president in his inaugural inaugural speech said that. He wants to take 100 million, people, 100 million people out of poverty, at least 10 million people per year. Now, if we are still at the point where the Honorable Minister has clearly told us that she's still struggling to understand programs that touch the lives of Nigeria and the people that really need these things, then there is clearly a problem at hand. I think the Honorable Minister should should focus on the supervisory role that she's supposed to play, you know, ensuring that the four programs under the SIP works perfectly well, you know, and work in tandem with the coordinators of the respective clusters of these programs. 
you know. So I, I think all right. I think so that, we'll, that we'll, be we'll have to work on that point then. But uh, there has to be a proper it. understanding of the scheme, including the counterbar funding, before they can go ahead and execute all of that. But thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. We will be back in a moment. Stay with us.